Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to another Live at Five virtual tour. I'm Kevin Atkinson, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today, I am delighted to be broadcasting uh, to you from the far eastern edge of campus, from the Brookside School uh, in the Meeting House. And the Meeting House is technically just the little building behind me with the copper roof. Uh, if you've attended Brookside School or if your family has, uh, you'll know that Brookside School is the elementary school and it continues rambling on down for quite a ways down the side of the road. And I've done a Live at Five, in fact, I think I did it about a year ago, uh, where I toured through the entirety of Brookside School. Today, though, I thought it would be interesting to take a closer look at the Meeting House. The Meeting House is really unique among all of Cranbrook's buildings in that it is the only building we have that was designed by George Booth himself. Uh, he designed it with his, young, uh, with his middle son, uh, Henry, or his youngest son, Henry Scripps Booth, who at that point in 1918 was uh, thinking about going to study architecture, but he had just graduated high school. And so this 18 year old, uh, or, or I guess he would have been 20, 20 something, uh, Henry Scripps Booth and George Goth Booth set out to build this little building behind me. And we are on the corner of Lone Pine Road and uh, Cranbrook Road. You can see Christchurch Cranbrook is straight on the hill and you can see Christchurch Cranbrook building a new wing onto their 1938 Sunday School wing. And I point that out because Christchurch Cranbrook and its Sunday School actually began right here at the Meeting House. And so there's any number of institutions at Cranbrook that can trace their way back to this little charming English cottage. Now, what inspired the construction of this building was a surplus of building materials that were around the campus. And so George Booth thought that he could use excess building materials in order to create a little multi-purpose space. And so the original idea was to actually not spend that much money, but instead to build a building that would be entirely made out of scrap material. Now, I do understand from the record that this is constructed out of excess construction material from Cranbrook House Library, which was an addition to George and Ellen Booth's home uh, that was put on in 1918. But it seems like from the diaries of Henry Wood Booth, George's father, uh, this idea of setting out to build a very inexpensive building with all the sort of assorted leftover building materials around the Cranbrook estate was a little bit foolhardy and what was supposed to be a free building ended up being, according to Henry Woodbooth, a very expensive, a too expensive building project. So we are, again, just focusing on the meeting house, which actually stopped right here. And you can even see that the stonework has a pretty sharp line there. Uh, and so had you been a visitor to the Bloomfield Hills Seminary, which was the first elementary school here in 1922, you would have dropped your children off here and this would have been essentially a one-room schoolhouse. Now, over time, it got many different additions and perhaps another Live at Five, we'll talk about Joaquin Youngworth and his charming little Mother Goose sculptures that are on the Ram House, which was the next edition in the mid-1920s. And then it sort of comes along 1928, 1932, all the way to 1937 with the tower. But again, we're focusing on the meeting house. And I'm gonna go ahead and cross over. It does have this wonderful um, dedication stone. And if you look at the dedication stone, you can see how it has a sort of funny division of the words uh, where meet ing are on two separate lines erected in the year 1918 with a period. And what I think is interesting about this uh, dedication stone is that the layout is really indebted to William Morris and to William Morris's sort of artistic printing. And many of you will know uh, that 
George Booth's first artistic enterprise was the Cranbrook Press, which was inspired by English arts and crafts presses and was inspired by William Morris's Kelmscott Press. So I love this little meeting stone because of that unusual arrangement of the words. It's very much typical for an arts and crafts press of that time. Now, eventually Christchurch Cranbrook would get its start here in the meeting house, and we have wonderful pictures of the Reverend Dr. Samuel Marquis uh, greeting the church members as they came into Sunday service. And of course, Cranbrook School and all of its many uh, campuses and iterations also trace their roots back here with the elementary school opening uh, in 1922 and then operating off and on. And then Cranbrook, uh, the girls' school, Kingswood, uh, opened by name, Kingswood School. It first operated out of these buildings before the Saarinen buildings were completed in 1931. So again, if we were visitors Way, way back in 1918, 100 uh, years ago, we would have just found one building. There was a lower level, but it wasn't even connected by stairs. Uh, and, and so it was just one room. There was at that time no stage on the end. The building was finished at around Christmas time, 1918, and the first use of the building was a sermon delivered by an 82-year-old Henry Wood Booth, George's father, on the first Sunday of 1919. Henry Wood Booth would continue to use the meeting house in this room to teach Sunday, uh, Sunday school lessons as well as to hold Sunday services up until July of 1919 when George and Ellen Booth began inviting ministers on a sort of rotation to come through and preach here at the meeting house. And in order to do that, they had to move the services from Sunday morning to Sunday evening because they were essentially, you know, having traveling preachers come here to the meeting house. Now, it was a little unclear to me in my uh, research this afternoon as to what point all the frescoes come in. I'm not sure if they were being painted around Christmas 1918 or if they were being painted in January of 1919, but no matter, uh, we shall appreciate the frescoes all the same. And we'll start with the heaviest hitter, which is the painting above the fireplace. And all of these paintings were done by the, uh, at the time, Detroit artist, Catherine Sibley McEwen. And Catherine McEwen is the artist who uh, would go on to paint the monumental frescoes at Christchurch Cranbrook. She also painted all the frescoes at Cranbrook School for Boys in the lower dining room. She also painted the ceilings of Studio Loya Saarinen. Uh, this, however, is her second work at Cranbrook and her oldest surviving work. So about 1911, she had painted some interiors at the old Brookside Cottage, which was the Henry Wood Booth and Clara Granger Booth residence. That's been torn down, so we don't know what her paintings looked like there. These are the ones that she does in 1918, 1919. And I mentioned that she's doing them around Christmas because I find the subject matter to be quite um, uh, Christmas themed. So what we have here are sort of uh, three figures, only one of whom is known as to who he is. And this is one of the three wise men. And so the idea with this piece is to commemorate uh, the new earth that is to come after World War I. And so you'll sometimes see this piece entitled The Hopes of 1918. Uh, and what we have is the sort of Christmas story, the hope that uh, the birth, birth of Christ brings to uh, Christians. And so we have the star up here, the star of Bethlehem. We have the wise man here. And he is holding a sort of astrolobe, an uh, astrological instrument meant to symbolize uh, the journey towards a new earth, a new peaceful earth. And of course, he's receiving his astrolobe from a youth. So we're sort of concluding World War I. The world is at peace. There's this new hope for tomorrow. And so George Booth and Catherine McEwen are sort of turning towards the Christmas story as a, a symbolic reference point from which to think about this new uh, a new post-Great War world. Now, I'm not sure who that leaves our figure on the right. Uh, 
uh, being uh, in his uh, jaunty toga and gold accessories with his wonderful lyre. And those of you who know the Christchurch Cranbrook murals know that Catherine McEwen was a redhead and she mostly painted redheads. Uh, I don't think they were quite related, uh, the fact that she always painted redheads uh, so much to her own hair color as to that being the, the most common sort of pre-Raphaelite color scheme. And so the pre-Raphaelite painters who said, you know, everything after Raphael was terrible, basically medieval art is the high point of painting. Uh, uh, that movement from the 1880s and 1890s in England, which is associated with the arts and crafts movement in architecture and decorative arts, the painting version of it, the arts and crafts, pre-Raphaelites, they always had red hair. So I think Catherine McEwen is uh, really turning towards redheads for that tradition, more so than her own hair. But who knows, maybe she just knew that redheads are pretty special and wanted to give George and Ellen Booth a red, uh, two redheads here in the meeting house. Now, I love her decorative scheme down below. Uh, which is sort of over this very simple brick fireplace. And if you've followed along with Lyot 5 or you've visited Cranbrook, you'll know that we have quite an assortment of uh, fireplaces, mo most of which were designed by uh, Eliel Saarinen, who really views fireplaces, hearths, as the center of his architecture, the center of a room. Uh, here, where George Booth is the designer, it's actually a very simple, a, a, a sort of surprisingly simple fireplace. And the uh, mantle, the sort of hearth, is simply illustrated in paint. Uh, and so we have these sort of fall of grapes, two oranges, and then orange blossoms with these wonderful leaves. And I don't know, uh, we really, unfortunately, you know, the meeting house is built in 1918, and very quickly after, George and Ellen begin sitting out to build more of the larger institutions, including the church, and, and there's just not a lot of reflection given by the booths to what they were thinking when they designed this building. And so I don't know why there are oranges and grapes, but I do know that uh, Ellen, George, and Henry Woodbooth had just visited Florida, which a visit to Florida uh, in 1917, uh, 1918 was a much more brutal and strange experience than a visit to Florida today, as all of you snowbirds start to think about heading south uh, when fall comes. They were really going to this swampy frontier, and one of the only big tourist sp spots was this famous orange orchard. And we know the booths went, and we know they enjoyed it because they took quite a bit of photographs, quite a number of photographs, and quite a few postcards and souvenirs. So maybe they were thinking about their visit to the orange groves and orange blossoms of Florida as they are having them painted within this uh, fresco. Now I turn the camera at this angle to show you that this is actually carved into the plaster. So McEwen would have been painting this on wet plaster as a fresco and carving out the figures into the plaster as well. So you can see our wise man, his robes are actually three-dimensional. Now, we'll just finish up our discussion of the uh, uh, sort of fireplace construction with a look at these andirons. And uh, Leslie Mayo, the center's associate registrar, and I just spent a few days in July going through every room at Brookside inventorying the material. Strangely, these andirons were not on our inventory. And so Leslie and I took all the decorative logs out, we cleaned the andirons, we looked for markings, we looked for any type of information. Uh, we couldn't really find anything from the andirons, so our next step is to look through George Booth's diaries, his construction documents, uh, and try and figure out who made these, because my speculation is that these are George Booth designs, um, and that they probably do date all the way back to 1919. Uh, they are sort of wonderfully handmade fireplace tools and implements, and they have this really sort of chunky arts and crafts um, uh, form to them. I think they're perfectly proportioned to this large room, because they really do have a very strong presence here in the fireplace. So at the moment, I'm attributing these to George Booth until we can find the, the, the answer in the archives. And I've been at Cranbrook now for five years as of last week, uh, and that is long enough to know that 
I will probably find the answer. There are not too many mysteries that the archive can't reveal. It's simply a mystery to me and my inventory at the moment, but we'll sort that out, exactly how these andirons got here. Now, the next biggest painting that Catherine McEwen did uh, is over the, the window opposite the fireplace. And so above we have the Tudor Rose. I don't know exactly why uh, George Booth or Catherine McEwen went with the Tudor Rose or why that is the only ceiling decoration. So again, uh, not too much was written in George's letters or diaries about this. In Henry Scripps Booth or Henry Wood Booth, the father or the son, they also did not describe uh, why there was a single Tudor rose on the ceiling. So that's, a, again, a bit of a mystery that I imagine three years from now I will be researching something totally different and find the reference as to why that Tudor rose is right there. But below that is a quote from Sir Francis Bacon, which again goes with this sort of uh, uh, concluded, concluding of the Great War, the end of World War I, George Booth selects this quote, the sovereignty of man lieth, in, uh, lieth hid in knowledge wherein many things are reserved which kings with their treasure cannot buy. And he's cutting short the quote by Francis Bacon here uh, because it actually goes, kings with their treasure cannot buy uh, nor can with armies sort of plunder. Um, I did not write down the exact quote, but uh, it's interesting that there's enough room in this wall for him to put the whole quote had he wanted, but I think it's interesting that he uh, leaves out the sort of idea that, you know, we can't, we can't buy art and nature, nor can, that's what, that's what the quote is saying, uh, but, but he also is leaving off the part that is like, you can't fight for art and nature, which in a sort of World War I iconography, seems like he could have kept that part in there, uh, you know, the sort of peace, peaceful opinion of the, the Sir Francis Bacon quote. Even more lovely than the words themselves are these peacocks that go around the room. And as someone who leads quite a lot of tours around Cranbrook, I'm very often asked why we have so many peacocks. Uh, of course, peacocks have a long and storied history in art history for many, many millennia. Uh, and so here again, we see the peacock a popular form uh, in the arts and crafts uh, style, even more popular in the art deco. Uh, here are what I believe 1918 are some of the oldest peacocks at Cranbrook because it really is the Sarnans who, arriving at Cranbrook in 1925, begin to design peacocks on pretty much any item that one can add a peacock to. Uh, but here we can see already this international trend of using peacocks within architectural decoration uh, taking place here. Now, we'll look a little more closely at the over window decorations because I can get you closer on the camera. Uh, you can see that it is a combination of paint and gilding. So this is uh, the, the gilt leaf has been added. Now, they do look great. Unfortunately, if you compare these paintings to what is at uh, Christchurch Cranbrook or even what is over the fireplace, um, these were restored not by an official art restorer, but by an academy painting student, uh, uh, a certain Mr. Tim uh, from 1980. And I do think that the originals, that, that the restoration slightly flattened some of the colors and details. Uh, if you look at unrestored paintings by Catherine McEwen, the sort of solid blue and solid green body just doesn't quite line up with how she usually would have painted. So I do wonder somewhat if the restoration, though done with the best of intentions, uh, didn't change the sort of detail of these pieces. But overall, of course, they're still quite beautiful. Now, Catherine McEwen also painted all of the woodwork trim around the room. And there are these haunting little faces that are inset within the uh, uh, sort of crown molding, along with more Tudor roses, a gentleman's face, and then I believe that might be a thistle. Uh, and so you have sort of face plant, face plant, face plant. I'll make sure not to fall off the stage and do my own face plant. I'll be here all week. 
So along the beams, Catherine McEwen also does this stencil work, which is very much uh, sort of in the arts and crafts vogue to think about uh, adding stencil and decoration onto the beams. And again, all of this being designed by George Booth, who also designs the three hanging light fixtures. And I have not seen photos. I'm not saying that they don't exist. I have not seen them uh, with candles in these light fixtures, though presumably uh, Booth envisioned that you could operate either the glass light in the center or candles. You know, the Booths loved a dramatic uh, scene setting and, and certainly a candlelit version of the meeting house would be very romantic. What is perhaps most surprising to those of you who have uh, attended a show here are uh, are looking at it for the first time now, is that this is a George Booth design light fixture made of a hubcap there in the center. The hubcap has been welded to with little hooks and then chains are supporting old iron tire rims. And so remember outside, I said that uh, this building was meant to be really built on the cheap using scrap materials. This is one of the only examples where scrap materials actually do play a part. And so you have an old tire hubcap and an old tire iron rim being used and then these custom little candle holders welded around the edge and the light being dropped through the center. So these are sort of upcycled car parts into these whimsical medievalizing arts and crafts chandeliers. And there are three of them hanging here in the room. Now, looking at the next windows, all the different patterns are, are all the windows do have different patterns. And we have a different sort of bird making an appearance down here under the window uh, in a pattern that's, I think, pretty inspired by Owen Jones and his grammar of ornament, this sort of beautiful little pattern of birds looking up and down, tails going up and down, very charming. And around the, at the end of each of the two big beams going across the middle of the meeting house, are these wooden sculptures of the four apostles. And these were carved by the German-American woodcarver Johannes Kirschmeier, or John Kirschmeier. He was born in Obergemerau, Germany, in Bavaria, known for its wood carvers. Kirschmeier carved all of the woodwork at Cranbrook House, including the famous overmantel in the Cranbrook House Library. Uh, and so he would have been doing these four saints at the same time that he did the Cranbrook House Library carvings. And so it is the, the four apostles represented by their uh, animals. And so here is St. Mark, the lion. And then we come across and we have St. Luke as the bull. And they have that, that really sort of signature Kirschmeier um, aesthetic, really, you can see the chiseled wood, you can see the wood carver's uh, handiwork there. They have this beautiful depth and character, and then they've been highlighted with uh, gold leaf and color, possibly by Catherine McEwen. Henry Woodbooth said it was Catherine McEwen, and then in the archives, Henry Scripps Booth crossed it out and said, not true. So <laughs> I'm not sure who exactly added the gold leaf and the red carving. Here's St. John as an eagle. Looking across. And then our last apostle, St. Matthew. And of course the booths were uh, very religious, very dedicated Episcopalians. And I mentioned that Christ Church Cranbrook got started in this very room, first through sermons by uh, Henry Woodbooth, who had earlier been giving sermons in a tent across the street, uh, but then by visiting preachers. Ann Booth was the first person baptized in this uh, church, in this meeting hall in July of 1919. Uh, and then Dr. Reverend Samuel Marquis started services for Christ Church here before his own great church was completed by George and Ellen and the architect Oscar Murray uh, in 1929. But Christ Church continued to use this building until 1938 when the Sunday school was added on. And so in 1938 uh, was the last time that Christ Church Cranbrook was operating Sunday school in the meeting house. And then they moved into that little 
um, uh, stone building there. And you can see now in 2022, Christchurch Cranbrook will finish a new Sunday school building. If you've ever wondered why we were called Brookside, uh, well, there is the brook that is running aside the building. So one of the early problems with the meeting house was you could not get from one floor to the other. And so at some point, George and Henry designed a spiral staircase. And I think I'll end my live at five by going down the stairs and showing you uh, the back of the meeting house because it is pretty charming. But before we get there, I want to just look at the last of Catherine McEwen's paintings. Also one which probably... Um, has been altered the most by restoration. Uh, and so this one says, Gloria in excelsis Deo et in terra pax. And so glory to God in the highest and uh, peace on earth. And so that is the doxology there, again, commemorating the end of World War I. 1918 in the center, which does lead me to believe that Kent McEwen was painting these in 1918. Uh, and you can see the angels on horseback on either side. And then you can see that it has been restored in 1980 by Ted Nofsinger. I do love that this uh, little architrave has the sort of depth that it's set within the door. So it has the wonderful little colorful ornaments going around the inside as well. Now, I believe that these are Catherine McEwen, uh, but on the door itself, there are also two uh, portraits of, again, in the sort of medieval style, St. George slaying the dragon, which brings my known count of St. George slaying the dragon created at Cranbrook in 1918 to at least six versions of St. George slaying the dragon uh, commissioned by George Booth in that one year. I don't know if St. George was his favorite saint or if it is as St. George and the Dragon always have been um, a very sort of rich architecture or art artistic inspiration. You know, it's, it's, if you're going to illustrate a saint, why not do the one who has a dragon? But it does mean that we have a lot of St. George and the Dragon here at Cranbrook. Now, if, if you have not watched my previous Live at Fives, uh, or if you've never seen the rest of Brookside School, that tour is available if you scroll back in time on Facebook. Uh, but I would like to leave us today to just focus on the meeting house. I'm not sure what year the stage was installed, but again, it was not original. And neither was this slightly terrifying spiral staircase. And I'm sure that had I told the instructor who uses this room that I was coming through it, she would have cleaned this up. But we shall make it over and out because I would like to show us the back of the meeting house, which is pretty sh charming in it of itself. And so uh, we have the spiral staircase added on in this sort of circular turret on the side of the meeting house. And originally, you would have just gotten in here by coming down to the Brookside level uh, and, and using an exterior staircase. There's also the sort of charm of the board and batten construction, uh, not board and batten, the half timbering construction, which in the winter you can see it better that George Booth has a very kind of romantic relationship with half timbering, and his half timbers are all sort of different angles and different uh, designs. Now, Catherine McEwen would come back to this campus and she would do uh, even more murals as part of the Ram House. And so this is a little bit later. As soon as I say the date, I will see the date. I think it's 1924, 1923, AD 1923, there in the middle. And so this is also Catherine McEwen done in the wet plaster on the exterior of the school. So that's the story of the meeting house uh, today for a one room building that you can really trace back almost every part of Cranbrook's history to. Uh, 
today. It is used just by Brookside, and it's used for all of their plays, their auditorium, their uh, uh, little choral concerts, and, and it's a, essentially a little theater. But you can trace back most of Cranbrook's institutions to this one room. Next week, I will be back with another live tour related to Christchurch Cranbrook. This one has been a long time in the making, but next Wednesday at 5 p.m. we should be hopefully coming live from Christchurch Cranbrook. I know a lot of you have requested that tour, and I'm excited to finally have the opportunity uh, to be in the church and uh, uh, bring you to what is considered the last great uh, arts and crafts church constructed in the uh, the sort of story of the arts and crafts movement. This is really the, the pièce de résistance, the last arts and crafts church. So that will be next Wednesday, and who knows what will be in the Wednesday after. Thanks so much for coming along on our little tour of the Brookside School Meeting House. I'm Kevin Adkison, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Until next week, good to see you all.